News Talk Radio, CJAD 800. When asked, uh, many children declare they want to be an astronaut when they grow up, but how many actually accomplish the goal? For my next guest, he watched the Apollo moon landing at age nine. That childhood wish became a reality, but not without its challenges along the way. And uh, though at the time Canadians couldn't even apply to be part of the space program, he somehow went on to become the first Canadian to command the International Space Station. He achieved rock star status with the performance of David Bowie's space audit recorded on board the International Space Station and viewed by a few people. Uh, more than 19 million uh, people here on Earth. And he retired after returning from outer space earlier this year. And now he's got a new book, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, here in studio to talk about his experiences. We welcome one of the coolest guys to walk on the planet, astronaut Chris Hatfield, who joins me now. Good morning. Good morning on a nice, cool day. Yeah, the, the first text that came in uh, from Dean and NDG that you're here said, uh, you're the coolest Canadian in the world. You should run for prime minister of Canada. <laughs> Any political ambitions? No, none. None. Okay. Uh, this one says, ask Chris if he got together with William Shatner, when he sp- who he spoke to from space, and they said they'd get together on his porch. We haven't yet. I've been talking to him about it, and he invited me, he invited me for sushi when I was in L.A. <laughs> last week, but I didn't see him. But I reiterated my invitation to come to a summer home and have uh, whiskey and cigars on the porch. I look forward to talking to him. Uh, tell me about uh, your very appearance as soon as you showed up here at the radio station created quite a buzz among the staff. Does this happen wherever you go these days? Wherever I go, yeah. It's it, But, you know, it's, it's a good thing. It's a reflection of all of the work that, that we've done, of all the things the space agency does, the work that I put in over the last 21 years, and the success we had during five months on the space station. It's really delightful. Everybody wants to know what you think of the movie Gravity. <laughs> I like the movie Gravity. It, it, the, the visuals, if you want to see what it looks like to do a spacewalk, go see Gravity. There is no movie better for giving you that feeling of being alone in the universe. Now, you knew you wanted to be an astronaut when you watched the moon landing. At at what point did you realize that this was going to turn into a a reality? Uh, In 1983, because we'd built the the Canada arm, the big robot arm for the space shuttle, Canada got an invitation to hire astronauts in 1983. And that was Mark Garneau and Roberta Bondar, that class. But that was really the, the actual door. Up until then, it had just been like, well, who knows, maybe someday. But that was the door opening for Canada. And so it was a huge, um, I don't know, revitalization of my dreams of, hey, this isn't just some little kid's pipe dream. This is something Canadians are going to do, and, and I want to really pursue it now. Tell us about the preparation for, for a trip in, into space. How, how rigorous is the training? You would not believe the level of training that astronauts go through. I had to learn to be an IMAX cameraman. I had to learn how to do surgery and work in a burn ward. I worked in the hospital in Houston sewing people up in in emergency just so that I had those basic skills. I had to learn to speak Russian so then I could fly as the left seater in the Russian Soyuz spaceship. Had to learn everything about the shuttle, everything about the station, everything about the Soyuz, orbital mechanics, um, geology, photography. I mean, it's just a widespread of stuff. And and the real hardest part of it all is how do you keep that in the front of your mind? How do you not forget the important stuff at the time that it really matters? It's, it's a lifetime of work and study, but boy, it leads some interesting places. Now, now the first time you, you went up, I, I want to get, get your feelings. Were you scared, excited? Was it a, a combination? I, I want to, when you looked down and saw the entire planet from outer space, What are the thoughts that go through your mind at the time? The first launch, uh, if I had to describe my emotion, it was, it was uh, like exquisitely focused, you know, where you you have so, you you know, you're, you're flying a spaceship during launch, which is the riskiest thing I've done in my life. And we say in the astronaut office, there is no problem so bad that you can't make it worse. So you really have to know what you're doing. And so you are as focused as a human being can be on the next second and the second after that. But at the same time, it's just so joyful. It is such an amazing adventure to be a part of. It's your dreams coming true, all happening uh, in one rapid, uh, overpowering emotional thing. So it's a lot of fun riding a rocket ship. And then seeing the world to then suddenly go from the roaring power of nine minutes of launch to the uh, eternal tranquility of peaceful weightlessness is bizarre and the world is pouring by underneath you at eight kilometers a second and you see the whole thing and at first you just see uh you know like familiar things uh you know you look for places you've been or you want to see timbuktu for the first time or there's the galapagos look at that the galapagos but after a while 
you start to get to know the world and then you start to look at it really intimately and, and see the, the beauties and the little textures and the changes from orbit to orbit and the seasonal changes. And, and you, you like develop a kinship with, with what the world is doing and how it's changing. And uh, that is probably the most rewarding part of it. How did you feel different when you came back? What were you like just before it started and when, when you came back? Uh, well, a large part of that is overshadowed by medical. When you come back, it's you are so sick. I mean, you're so dizzy. Your body can't plump, pump the blood up to your head anymore. You can't balance. Uh, you know, your bones are softened. Uh, I mean, there's just so much stuff going on. It, almost everything else is overwhelmed as if you're recovering from an illness or a car crash or both or something. But after a while... That, the, the noise that's in your foreground starts to settle and you start to notice the world around you. I think it took me the better part of six weeks to notice properly that I was back on Earth and, and doing normal things again. And about four months till I felt like I could run again properly. And it'll take about a year to grow my bones back to where, where they're going to be dense as they used to be. So it, it's, a, it's almost like one-on-one, -on -one, one day on Earth for every day that you spend in space to get yourself back to normal. But the things that I've seen and the the preparation that went into seeing them are such that they they change who you are you know they they permanently affect who you become at what point did you know you would write a book about your life and career uh I started thinking about it about 10 years ago and I remember I don't know seven or eight years ago I laid out sort of a skeleton of what the book ought to be it actually in the back of a sudoku book I still have it but on those little blank pages at the back I uh I laid out topics and things to remember and, and uh, the way I, but it was really just the result of uh, 20 years of given talks across Canada, the, the fascination and interest of the spaceflight experience, but really the underpinnings of what use is it? What, what does it mean for people? How can it be a guide to life on earth? And, uh, and so I started working on the book in earnest a little over two years ago. And um, I, I couldn't, spend any time on it while I was in orbit is just too busy. But since I got back, of course, to get it in time for the publisher in August, it, uh, it was a bunch of work. Uh, the book is called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. Chris Hatfield in studio with me. If you have any questions, you can text them to 514-800. Uh, what was the best part for you, the, the best part and the most challenging part about writing the book? The best part was finally, after a blur of... 20 years of experiences as an astronaut, which it's an extremely experience-rich job. <laughs> I mean, I've lived at the bottom of the ocean. I've piloted a one-person submarine. I've done two spacewalks. I commanded a spaceship. I've ridden three different rocket ships. I was NASA's director in Russia. You know, it's experience-rich, but it goes by so blurrily fast. Finally, there was time to try and put it all together. And Actually, there was an impetus, a necessity to organize it all in my head and then to try and draw out of it what what out of this matters you know what's useful what 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 did i actually get out of this that other people may benefit from and so it's sort of like a, a great big messy garage full of some really useful tools and car parts and everything and finally getting it starting to get it organized so you can actually see what you have and it improves your efficiency and your capability when you finally get the time to organize that big raw material and potential. And the book did that for me. Very interesting questions coming in for Chris Hatfield, commander of the International Space uh, Station. Uh, th this question, uh, it says, uh, Commander, I have to ask for an honest opinion. What good has come out from all this money, time, energy invested in space research and space exploration? We'll have the answer to that question. And also this one, besides the obvious feeling of insignificance astronauts feel up there, was there anything you actually saw up there that shocked you? The answers to these questions next, 1045. Chris Hatfield, my guest, uh, the book, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. Jacqueline said, uh, you made us uh, Canadians very proud. I watched all your videos, lessons, and learned so much about space. You're an inspiration for us all. And Dean, who sent us the text earlier about your political ambitions, uh, he says, sorry, Mr. Hatfield, uh, he's too smart to be Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> uh, I, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, this is Troy. His question is, what was the best view of the Earth from space and what image took your breath away? Uh, I think the inherently most beautiful part of the world are the Bahamas. 
uh, the, the, the reef and the tongue of the ocean coming in and the depths of the blues that you see there. I think that's that or maybe just the raw power of the outback. Those are the two most beautiful parts take my breath away. But uh, sunrises are the best thing. You're coming around the world, we're going so fast, we force the sunrise. We drive into the sunlight and the sun just comes roaring up around the world like, a, like an accelerated explosion of kaleidoscopic color of a sunrise. It's gorgeous. And you get 16 of them a day. Well, because the obvious uh, feeling of uh, this texture saying, besides the obvious feeling of insignificance, astronauts feel up there. Was there anything you actually saw up there that shocked you? You know, a shocked astronaut is a bad thing. Uh, it's like being a shocked lion tamer or a shocked uh, Formula One driver. That's not what you want to have happen. I spent 21 years trying to get myself so ready that nothing would shock me. And it was really, it's more just the sense of awe. And, and the beauty and the power of where you are that, that fills your head, not, not a sudden uh, unprepared surprise. Chris, you've got to fess up. Listen to this text. It says, many astronauts have acknowledged seeing UFOs. Describe the type of UFOs that you saw and, <laughs> and what they did. Yeah, there's such confusion between science fiction and science fact. We are looking for life. We have a rover driving around on Mars that two weeks ago or three weeks ago found that every cubic foot of dirt on Mars has a liter of water in it. Mars has oceans of water and the biggest volcano in the solar system. If there is life off of Earth, Mars is the most logical spot. They got heat and water. But we, we are not seeing little whatever saucers <laughs> flying around. It's just, you know, people, um, yeah, it, it's just kind of funny to me. I mean, it's nice. It's an obvious thing to think, and it's kind of fun. And I'm sure there's life in the universe somewhere. There's an unlimited number of planets. To think we're the only one that developed life is just arrogance. But at the same time, to think that we're so fascinating that they're here sneaking around is also just arrogance. Uh, Colonel Hatfield, I want to ask your honest opinion. What good has uh, come out from this money, time, energy invested in space research and space exploration? That's from another texter. Yeah, it's a good question. I ask myself that constantly as an astronaut since I was spending and other people's money to do it. Uh, most people that ask the question don't know how much we spend. They often think it's far more in proportion than it is. For every $1,000 of federal dollars that we spend, we spend about three cents on the astronaut program and about $240 on health and welfare out of every 1000 To me, that's a pretty good proportion. If you completely canceled it, three cents out of every $1,000, it would be lost in the noise of what we choose to spend money on as a, as a nation. But if you look at this, the best success story, well, there's... there's um, Microflow, a great little experiment that came just uh, down the river here from Quebec City, which does blood analysis in a thing the size of a toaster. A great invention. But Canadarm's probably the iconic one. From a simple invention back in the 60s, we built and sold Canadarm's to the shuttle in the 70s and 80s. That put us on board the space station with Canadarm 2. And the great granddaughter of Canadarm 2 is NeuroArm, which uh, a surgeon sits in another room with robotic controllers and does brain surgery inside an MRI in Canadian hospitals with precision that's never been seen before. That's a terrific example of Canadian technology being sold internationally, being used on the edge of invention, and now having practical applications back across the country. Another text, Chris wants to know, uh, were you able to see any effects of climate change from space? Oh, absolutely, uh, both man-made and natural. After Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines in the early 90s, uh, it cooled the whole world. One small volcano cooled the world by a degree for a year. And you could see it from space. You could see the particles in the upper atmosphere like a, like a rainbow or a layer cake. Um, so there are some natural ones. But if you look at the Aral Sea, which is what used to be the fourth biggest sea on Earth, like a great lake, and because of human... Um, short-sightedness. We completely dried up that lake. There's almost none of it left. It changed the local climate dramatically. The glaciers that used to count on the lake effect are now receding incredibly fast downwind of it. That's a human mistake that drastically changed a local climate. And when we look at the Great Lakes right now, they're as low as they've ever been. That may be an effect also. What is the one thing uh, Chris would like uh, readers to take away from the book that's coming up next? The book is called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. Chris Hatfield in studio with me. You're listening to the Tommy Schnurmacher Show on CJAD. Hi. Chris Hatfield, my guest in studio. What's the one thing you'd like readers to take away from the book? Uh, I hope folks can take away something useful. If I had to pick something out of it, I would say it is how to deal with fear in your life. Because astronauts do something that is extremely dangerous and should be extremely fear-making, getting on a big explosive to have it push you vertically into space. And we 
had to develop mechanisms by which we could address a roaring fear, find our way to work around it, and be able to function in an extremely uh, terrifying, inherently terrifying environment. And a lot of people deny themselves whole sections of life because of an irrational fear. So how can you work around those? What are the coping mechanisms? And I really tried to dig into that into the book of how we do it, how we get around it, how we get to command spaceships as a result of getting around it, and maybe how other folks can think about it. Uh, Jim has this question. Ask the, the commander what it would take for a politician to make a Kennedy-like speech to drive humanity to Mars and beyond. And, and another text, you're wanting to know how you see space travel in the next 20 to 50 or 100 years. You think we're going to reach planets in other galaxies? Uh, I think the exploration of space is following the classic human pattern of how we've explored everywhere else, uh, where we send out, we, we become vaguely aware of something, we have an advance in technology, and we send a probe. And my family sent a probe over in 1827 to Montreal from Scotland, their 19-year-old son, to report on you know whether this was a habitable place or not. And eventually the whole family moved here. We sent those probes. Kennedy decided to send a probe back in the early 60s. Let's try. But it was very geopolitical. You know, it's, it's a proxy Cold War. And I, I'm sure that if Kennedy hadn't been shot, they would not have walked on the moon. That was a weird juxtaposition of historic events that allowed them to get to the moon by 69. What we're doing now is the next phase, and that is leaving Earth permanently. It's sort of like the first habitation out of Africa or the first one 30,000 years ago into North America. And we're just starting to do that with our technology leaving Earth. And I don't think the next destination will be Mars. It'll be the moon. A gift giving time. This texter wants to know if the book is good for a 13 year old. Uh, as my wife says, makes a great Christmas gift. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chris Hatfield, my guest, thank you so much for joining us. The book is called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. You're listening to The Tommy Schnurmacher Show on CJAD.